Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. <laughs> well, you'll be happy to know that I, I haven't read another book this week. <laughs> we get another half hour sermon. Um, I'm continuing to read that excellent Marilyn Robinson book, and I just wanted to mention that we've had a congregation member offer to buy a copy of that book for our library. So if you are interested in reading it, it's the book I referred to in my sermon last week, we'll have a copy there. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book uh, to help us understand this idea of the, um, uh, the transcendent points of reference. Uh, she doesn't use that phrase in her book, but as you go through it, um, you get this really nice sense of a grounding of our faith. And that's what we're really talking about with transcendent points of reference, these kind of indispensable things that are beyond culture or you know, beyond our particular denomination that are beyond all of that. They provide the grounding for our faith. And we started out with one that was you know, pretty, um, pretty easy for most people, though not necessarily easy to understand, the Trinity, right? Most Christians, uh, certainly in the West anyway, are, uh, uh, take the Trinity as kind of a grounding for our faith, that God can be God, Father, and Son, all, uh, Father and Holy Spirit all at once, um, and we, we came to the conclusion that that meant that God could be transcendent up in heaven and imminent down here with us all at the same time. Kind of this marvelous dancing cycle of holiness represented by the Trinity. And last week we talked about what we were calling the givenness of things, right? Things are what they are. And the important element of that is, is things are what they are because God made them that way, and God made them in order to fulfill God's purposes, not ours. So this week we're talking about the dignity and nobility of humanity. And when you, when you start with this, you might think, well, that seems, doesn't seem very transcendent, does I mean, here we are, and all of our stuff, we're right here. Um, and so I want to talk about the, not necessarily the, the physical nature, if you will, of humanity, but God, uh, humanity's connection to God that makes it transcendent, not just theoretically, but again, across Christian faiths beyond denominational, cultural aspects to Christians' faith, there is a deeply rooted core of the dignity and nobility of humanity. Now, we can start with, where, where would we start? Genesis. Where else would you start? You start with Genesis. Well, each day, you know, God creates light and divides the heaven and the earth, and there's water, and then there's animals, and God says, it's good, it's good, it's good. All of creation is good. And then in, uh, uh, the, uh, on the sixth day, God creates humanity, man and woman. He created them. And at the end of that section, God says, it is very good. Maybe we're a little different in God's eyes. Now, I know it's, it's been popular. It's been uh, uh, bandied about more than once in history that we're, we're just sort of mammals, right? And we, we live in equality uh, in all ways with other mammals. So me and an aardvark. Aardvark's a mammal, right? In God's eyes are the same. While I believe that God commands us to be respectful of creation, I don't think we are the same in God's eyes. And the difference is our ability to have consciousness of God. I love my golden retriever. She is a beautiful dog, and she's happy, and she might even have a soul and go to heaven. But she has no consciousness of God. We have been granted this 
immense responsibility. It is a gift, but it is a responsibility. God has entrusted humanity to carry out his purposes in creation. My golden retriever, for the most part, just does what her instinct tells her to do. A little bit trainable, but you know golden retrievers. But humanity has the ability to discern, to choose free will, also part of the givenness of God. That's a huge responsibility. And right there, without going any farther, we can see this idea of the nobility and dignity of humanity because we've been granted this consciousness of God. And we've been granted these incredibly important choices about how we use that consciousness. And it is certainly true that throughout history that consciousness of God has been forgotten, ignored, tossed away, and inevitably the result is a degradation of the dignity and humanity of God. Now we might look at, oh, we can go way back in history. I, I read somewhere that in the building of one of the, one of the great pyramids in Egypt, 250,000 slaves died. These are nameless, never recorded in history, but basically the untouchables of society, right? They're just, they're not people. They're, they're just things that build a pyramid. Now that is degrading of human dignity and nobility. And, and you all know what an untouchable is, right? In the Hindu caste, well, I, I say you do know, now I'm going to explain it. In the Hindu caste system, you have four uh, levels of society. You know, the, the Brahmins at the top, I can't remember all the names. And each person within that caste cannot move among the castes. You cannot rise in the caste. But you can become the best possible, whatever level you are, and that will eventually bring you to nirvana. All right? And then... So everybody has an opportunity to kind of reach this spiritual level in Hinduism, except the untouchables, the poor at the bottom of society. They don't choose to be untouchables. They're just there. And that has, that has persisted in Hinduism even today. There's a lot of improvements in India about that, but think of that concept. But we don't have to go to India to think of that concept. Weren't Negro slaves or freed Negroes thought of as three-fifths of a person? Right? Legally? That's not that long ago that we choose to degrade. Now, why is that? Why is that bad? It really... The answer is reasonably obvious. In the case of our 250,000 slaves being killed, and in all of the other cases, many of those cases involve not simply thinking of a person as being less than human, but thinking of a people as being less than human. We see that all through history. Oh, those people that belong to that group are less than human, so I don't have to treat them like they're human. I can degrade their humanity without any consulting of what, that, uh, what individuals have brought to that culture or even the culture they're in. The, the extermination of the Jews in World War II is a perfect example of this. All of those Jews think all alike, they do all the things, things, they're all stealing our money, so tragically we know what happened. This is a huge sin. 
This is a massive sin. And you can, I'm, I know I'm bouncing around a little bit here in history, but you can go right back to Jesus. Sure, Jesus pe preached to crowds, but there was no sense that everybody in the crowd belonged to one group and Jesus would wave his hands and they'd all be saved, right? Because they belonged to that group. And the most poignant moments in the New Testament, in the Gospels, is where Jesus brings this incredibly powerful message of salvation and forgiveness to an individual. You think of the blind beggar at the Sloan Pool, the woman who is hemorrhaging, and of course, this beautiful, beautiful story that Lynn read for us about the woman, a sinner, no question about it, who comes and kisses Jesus' feet, humbles herself. Jesus didn't say to her, you and your family and everybody who you worship with is saved. Jesus said, you are saved because I have forgiven you and granted that grace. We are called as these agents, if you will, with our consciousness of God to do the same. We cannot condemn people for sin. Whatever you want to define as sin. We don't have to enable it or affirm it, but we are called because of our consciousness of God and our connection through Christ to at least bring that scope and that power of forgiveness to those who wish to repent. That hand has to always be open, no matter how egregious you think the sin might be. Again, Jesus never affirms sin. Jesus never encourages people to sin. Jesus takes them where they are, meets them at their lowest point, at their highest point, at their most sinful point, at their holiest point, and says, here I am. I give myself to you. Give yourself to me. When we start thinking of people as a collective, pinging around in history, that is the current term that we are using to lump people together. Currently on racial lines, but also on religious lines and other ways, we are sinning because we take away the ability to reach out and touch that one individual or five individuals or ten individuals, but that one soul that is wanting to give themselves to Christ, that has heard the call And that is what makes this a transcendent point of reference. Our call from God to assume the nobility and dignity of each individual. And why? Another transcendent point of reference, there is that little bit of God in everybody. Catholics call it the imago dei the image of God given to us on that first day of creation. Adam and Eve contained the image of God. Cain contained the image of God. Noah and his sons and their wives contained the image of God. David contained the image of God. All these famous names from the Bible. Those 250,000 slaves who died at the hand of the Egyptians contained the hand of God. 
the image of God, and that is what we need to remember in our interactions with everybody. Because as soon as we let sin be our sole definition of a fellow human being, we are saying, we are denying the presence of the image of God within. Not everybody's going to respond to that. We know that. But I'm not talking really, in a sense, I'm not talking about their souls. I'm talking about your soul, my soul. If I cannot keep that hand of Christ open, I may be shutting it for someone. And that is a great gift of God, given on the day of creation, passed down to each and every one of us. Amen.